time for episode number 164 of Let's Go Racing Time. We're Jim Stavon. I kind of got here with you as we look back at the weekend that was at the Charlotte Roval. A big win for Kyle Larson and one that uh, came with a little bit of uh, controversy afterwards with uh, a shakeup in the NASCAR playoff picture. We'll talk about all that. We'll also look ahead to this weekend's race at Las Vegas as we begin the round of eight. And we have a fantastic guest joining us this week. BJ McLeod is here, NASCAR driver, team owner. Got a great conversation we'll have with him coming up in just a little while. But first, Dominic, let's uh, look back at uh, the Roval real quick. Kyle Larson gets the win. And, I mean, he, he's just been on one. Like, we've talked about this year of guys trying to separate themselves and, you know, just how much parity there's been, especially in recent weeks. Seems like Kyle Larson has emerged as uh, the class of the field. He he's, looks like the guy to beat right now. And the driver that's peaking at the right time. He's won two playoff races already. Six wins on the year, so he's just overshadowing everybody heading into this weekend's race. But uh, you look at it, too, from a historical standpoint, too, Tyler. Now separating himself. 30th all-time on the NASCAR wins list with 29 wins. Next drivers, he's going to be coming up on our Dale Jarrett, Fireball Roberts, Martin Truex Jr. Some real serious company the more you climb up that wins list. But that five-team... Looking as good as ever. Tyler, I would say, has shades of that 2021 championship run. Yeah, uh, that season he won, what was it, eight, nine races that nine year? Races. They dominated from start to finish that, that year. And now you look at the playoff picture this next round. Larson, of course, advances. Bell, Reddick, Byron, Blaney, Hamlin, Chase Elliott. And then Joey Logano. Initially, that was Alex Bowman, but uh, NASCAR ultimately ruled that his car weight was too low. Hendrick decides not to appeal. Joey Logano is in. Alex Bowman is out. What's your reaction to the drivers that advanced the round of eight and ultimately the decision uh, to bump uh, Bowman out and put Joey Logano in, Dom? Well, I think my initial reaction, we're on all these emails that NASCAR sends out the communication side, and I had my phone in my pocket. I didn't know for a while. I, I Put it in my pocket and I pulled it out about 30 minutes after it happened. So I'm catching up in real time, seeing all the tweets, all the notifications, and just certainly one of those type of bombshell kind of events because the 48 team looked like they had been good all playoff run and and we're going to advance easily to the round of eight. Joey Logano and that tremendous run looked like the drama had set up with Tyler Reddick barely making the playoffs. And now all of that is null and void. And, and oh, by the way, and for all you numbers guys out there, Joey Logano, of course, making the championship for an even numbered years. That streak still has a possibility of continuing this year by being able to be put back in the round of eight. They seem like they're hungry and that they're going to be coming back with a vengeance. Yeah. And uh, I'm surprised Hendrick didn't appeal the decision, but uh, ultimately they didn't feel like they had much of a case worthwhile. And so Alex Bowman doesn't advance and Joey Logano does. And there we are with the round of eight. We'll talk more about it coming up later. Dom, tell us about our guest this week. Uh, I, I think he's a fan favorite in the nascar world every time he gets on a racetrack i think people are excited to see him in that 78 car out there in the cup series competing in the xfinity series um he's you know also not only been a uh, successful driver but a, a very good team owner on multiple levels as well tell us about uh bj mcleod here so these diehards that have been following the show since day one know that BJ was on our show back in 2021. One of the original guests, he owns Live Fast Motorsports at the Cup Series, fields the number 78 entry. Oh, and he was David's boss, by the way, in 2017. I know we shared some of those stories last time he was on as well. But BJ, thanks so much for joining us here this week here on Let's Go Racing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you guys for having me on. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for being here, BJ. BJ, uh... First off, uh, catch us up to speed, man. What's all been going on with you? You uh, sold the charter for, for Live Fast and went to a part-time schedule this year. But I imagine even even part-time and, and all that, you've stayed relatively busy. What's been going on with you this year, man? Uh, just adjusting to uh, non-full-time racing. We've been uh, full-time for uh, since 2015, and uh, whether it was Xfinity, Trucks, or Cup. And then, um, you know, before that, we were racing quite a bit anyway with Super Lates, which, you know, we'd run 20, 30 races a year with those. So, um, you know, it's it's been a little bit of an adjustment, but it's been fun uh, focusing on a limited amount of races and 
trying to perform a little bit better. And we don't have the results that we wanted as far as finishing positions, but we, um, we didn't struggle at all with lead lap finishes this year. Um, we, you know, we were able to stay with the pack everywhere we raced, which was Atlanta, Talladega, Daytona. Uh, we got a lot better with the green flag stops and we had an awesome pit crew this year, uh, supplied by Hendrick and, just, um, you know, really worked on just getting better the limited amount of races that we were able to run. So um, that's uh, definitely accomplished that. And, uh, you know, looking forward to next year and trying to get, you know, uh, get the finishes that we deserve for the way we're running. How much of a confidence boost is that? Not only for you, but your your team, everybody that works on these cars, you guys show up and choose those, those quality races over quantity and the results are showing. You guys are running up front leading laps in contention in, in the mix for some really good results. How, how much confidence does that bring for you and for the entire organization? You know, it's, it's good for all of us. Cause um, you know, we've been, we've been fighting a long time and, and with an average finish somewhere around 30, depending on the year um, it's, you know, it was difficult. And, you know, now this year we leave Daytona and Talladega disappointed with lead lap finishes and, I think 22nd, 19 or 19th or something. So um, it's funny that, you know, our standards have changed so much and what we're trying to do. And Talladega was, you know, it turned into a wreck fest there. That big wreck was ridiculous. But um, Daytona, we were we were quick all day and we were right there at the, the back edge of the pack, just never really could get track position to move up. And, you know, even speedways now have turned into track position. You can't just take off and go. So it's, uh, it's difficult, but, you know, um, it's still – it's nice to know that we leave the track upset with a lead lap 19th place finish. That That is nice. Uh, now we, we mentioned, of course, you, you had the charter, you were full-time the last several years with live fast and you know, you and Matt Tiff were running that operation and, and, and I got to know Matt pretty well myself and, and seeing from just an outside perspective, BJ, like I can't imagine that, you know, I, I know you guys stepped, stepped away from the full-time stuff and sold the charter, but, I would think you got to be proud of what you guys accomplished for being a small team with the way you guys raced week in and week out uh, during that stretch. Uh, no, no regrets, uh, I would imagine, right? I mean, you you, you guys oh, no. got to be proud of what what you guys accomplished there in that stretch. Yeah, definitely no regrets. We um we definitely had, you know, just getting to the Cup Series as an owner, as a spotter, as a driver, as a crew member, as a crew chief, anything, anywhere, it's an accomplishment accomplishment right and you know we've i've done many of those i've worked on the cars i've spotted for them i've drove them i've owned them i've done i've done a lot of different positions right and you know that that is a huge accomplishment and we're very thankful for their full-time seasons as owners and you know still very thankful to be a part-time owner and going after those crazy finishes at the speedways you know so i'm um, very very pleased with all that and also at the same time, you know, wanted to have a full-time cup team for three or four decades and build into hopefully a top four, top five team. And that didn't happen. So, you know, there's, there's that side of it, but um, you know, I guess we can still accomplish what we want as a part-time team and uh, that's being competitive when we show up. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of positives, a couple of negatives, and that's just the way business goes. When you see the way the charter situation's going, uh, and, and you know you guys, of course, sold uh, last year your charter and everything. Do you, do you feel you got out at the right time? Uh, what, what, what do you think about how the timing worked out when you guys decided to, to sell that yeah. charter? For us, it was definitely the right time. Um, you know, we—that's why we did it. We had no intentions on selling, but we got in a position where the values had reached a point where. We uh, we just assessed our own our own position and, and it was an you know an absolute yes to sell. So, you know, I feel a hundred percent confident that uh, we made the right decision there. And you know, as far as moving forward, we're just uh, you know focusing on being that part time team that runs better when we get around. Sure. That's so I'm sure we and a lot of the owners have been talking about too how they have no horse in the race. They're just kind of watching how everything plays out. Certainly you guys too with no charter, no problem with the whole 2311 front row motor sports thing. From your vantage point, I mean, how, how closely are you following everything and, and and glued to the news cycle of this whole situation? I kind of staying out of that. I um I don't really we were on our last race, it was Talladega, and I was focused on that. And um just, you know, obviously I see everything, but not digging into it too much because anything like that, there's a lot of details that don't, don't make it to the public that you have to 
you have to know everything to form a correct opinion. And I just, I don't have interest in, in, uh, you know, forming opinions of things until I know all sides and every, uh, every detail. That's fair. Uh, with that said, BJ, you know, going from a chartered every week, full-time team to a non-chartered part-time team where you're, you're not guaranteed a spot each week, if there's a full field, um, how, how different has that transition been for, for your team and your, your operation to, to, to go through what you've gone from where you're at last year, where you're at now, how, how big has that change been? You know, all the, all the physical and, um, you know, I guess money side of things is easy. I mean, it's very simple to go back to part-time, right? Um, it's been difficult because everybody on the race team is a racer. We're, we're built to be at the racetrack. We're not built to be at home 30 weeks a year and, and race six or seven. Right. So that's been the hard part is I have guys that, you know, bust their butts to get us to the track 38 weeks in a row. And then all of a sudden I tell them, Hey, you know what? We're not in that big a hurry. We're going to be at the track seven times this year. And Oh, by the way, you got two months to prep for Daytona and Atlanta. that will be back to back. So we're really only prepping for five races throughout the season. So that's been the difficult part. You know, you just, racers like to race they uh they even though it's very difficult work and at times i may complain about the work um it's still it's a life right and uh that's been the difficult side earlier this year had a really fascinating conversation with a fellow nascar driver slash turn team owner in carl long and and i remember he had said they had the the next gen vehicle and they sat on the sideline there for a while and just wasn't worth it taking it to the track and they sort of showed up this year they put david in a race they put josh balicki and others timmy hill and I had asked him, like, well, what changed for you? What made that worth it to take that cup car to the track? And he said, well, you're not making money if that car is not going on the track. And I'm paraphrasing on what he had said. But he had also had lent the idea of, yeah, you, you put other drivers in the, the car that can have that opportunity possibly. Is that something that you guys have thought of or, or would entertain if somebody approached you guys and said, hey, we want to we want an X, Y, Z, ABC races with your team. How do we make it happen? Yeah, I think for me, it's just making sure that, you know, it's it, it's at this point, NASCAR's approval process has gotten very difficult, right? And you uh, you basically have to be a winner in trucks, Xfinity, before you're ever going to get a cup license now. So, um, you know, with that being said, pretty much everybody that, you know, would want to do a couple races, they're, you know, capable of staying lead lap if the equipment's correct, right? If the budget's right. So I think for us, we have good equipment, but it takes a lot of money to run, right? So it would be a situation that it would have to match up with a marketing partner that the driver, you know, the driver's got a good relationship with that they want cup exposure and the driver wants cup seat time. And we would absolutely do that. I just... I I want to make it clear. I'm I mean, running 30th to 35th in the Cup Series now is respectable. Like it really is. It's not what people want. But the Delta now. Look at a Cup race now from first to 36th, and look at it six years ago. It'll be a second and a half closer. I guarantee it. So it's wild the amount of competition, how how stacked it's gotten. And you know, I feel like there's people out there that are in trucks or Xfinity that could definitely benefit from seat time and cup cars before they maybe land a bigger ride in cup through success and Xfinity and trucks. So we would absolutely like to be that stepping stone and do that. It's just uh, putting, putting the deals together is, is difficult. I, I think Ross Chastain and Alex Bowman are two perfect examples, you know, running for lower budget teams, run, ran a lot of races in the back of the field. And now look at them uh, with the success they've had and all that experience they gained. So uh, that's a great example there. BJ, uh, what, what are you doing in, in the downtime since, since you don't, aren't, aren't running every week? What, uh, what, what are you doing in between races these days? What keeps you busy? The first crazy thing we did was, uh, you know, Jessica and I've got to figure out ways to make money and we just, that's just who we are. So, um, I think within four weeks of the off season last year, we committed to be, uh, be a partner and I, Alpine coaster and um, Pigeon Forge. So we're actually building a, uh, a coaster on the parkway and Pigeon Forge. If you've ever been to Pigeon Forge, there was a big old steel cage up there off the side of the, the parkway right before you leave town, headed down to Gatlinburg. And uh, we uh, we ended up acquiring that property through a lease and 
and uh, bought some of it. And um, we're putting up a coaster right on the parkway in Pigeon Forge. So that was the first thing we did. Uh, looking forward to that. It should open, you know, anywhere spring to early summer next year is the target. So depending on weather, but um, you know, looking forward to that uh, business venture. And then uh, we've done some real estate stuff uh, in between selling and now just a couple of investment properties. And, um, you know, other than that, uh, having fun. We, um, we've traveled a little bit. We, uh, we've done, I've put a go-kart track in at the house here an asphalt oval, um, got an RC car track indoor now and, uh, just done some crazy stuff to have a good time. Yeah, that's great. Sounds like you're staying pretty busy, man. <laughs> Never, yeah. Well, we, for? yeah, we, um, we just, Jessica and I have, you know, we obviously built everything we've got from, uh, from nothing. Right. And, we um we're just not happy uh being being steady i guess <laughs> we we just we we like to go and make things happen and that um you know when we weren't a full-time cup team anymore it freed up a lot of capital to be able to to move into some other areas and amusement had always been one i'd been interested in and you know an actual full theme park is very 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 expensive that's a little out of my reach so we uh we found something that we could afford to be a part of and maybe build that up so you never know we might all more than one in the future so we'll see uh we'll see what happens but it's uh entertaining and you know we're still like i said we're doing real estate stuff which we've done forever and um you know we're just trying to pick and choose what we want to do there and just do uh just keep building the business side of stuff and then race and have a good time. Absolutely. I love it. That's fantastic. We're uh, joined by BJ McLeod this week here on Let's Go Racing. Uh BJ, in the time that you guys had to live fast as a full time team, you and Matt Tiff, you, you ran the majority of the races, obviously. And uh, you know, you had several drivers come through the fold. But since uh since you, you guys stepped away from full time r- racing and uh, Matt Tiff, your, your former partner, of course, is getting back on the racetrack and he won, uh, won a race this past week, uh, there at the Roval, actually. I think that's he, the second one. I think he won one earlier this year too, somewhere. Uh, yeah. Could we, poss- could we possibly see now that he's getting back to things, would there be a world maybe down the road where roles reverse, where maybe you're the owner and he's the driver this time? I don't, uh, I don't cross anything out. Everything's <laughs> possible, right? And uh, I love Matt, his family. Um, obviously, I've had a relationship with him for next year. It'll be 15 years now. And um, always open to discussing any of that. And I've been very excited to see Matt back driving. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, it's a great story. All he's been through, too. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah it's really cool. And he's he's got a baby now. And it's uh, it's cool that, you know, he's a dad racing. And, you know, if he if he does make his way back to you know, NASCAR, it'll be cool to, to see all that. So we'll see. Oh, yeah. That's, that, that's, that'll be a full circle story there, too, because I feel like he was on the door of winning a couple of Xfinity huh? races. He seemed very, very competitive when we saw him in a car. Yeah, no, it definitely – He, I feel like, you know, we would have still did what we did had he not had his seizure, but we would have been split in the car instead of me driving all the time. And him and I would have been the two drivers, not, you know, anybody else. And just would have been a completely different scenario. His life changed, you know, one day to the next and he made the most of it and and did it with a very positive attitude. And that's one thing I always really enjoyed about being around him. Sure. So before we came on here tonight, we were talking before the show started about 2025, how that may look at this time, the taping of this recording here in October, what do your 2025 NASCAR racing plans hold? Uh, I, I know we'll be back at the track next year at the races we wanted to run this year. So Speedways, um, Atlanta's, uh, we may throw in, you know, one or two more. Not quite sure yet. Um, on the Xfinity side, I'm just uh, waiting to see what all happens. I don't plan on, you know, I know I won't be running anything full time. I guarantee you that uh, I may run a race here or there. Uh, just kind of see. I want to see where everything falls once all the deals are done and and just see what's out there. Right. So. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll know a lot more. The deals, you know, that I would be a part of will be a January, February type thing if I was going to do anything. So uh, we'll just see what happens next year. So you see a lot of guys, too. Like one that comes to mind immediately would be Brandon Gunn, where he stepped away from that full-time seat, ran, enjoyed running the Super Speeder races for a very long time. Is that something you see yourself wanting to do over X amount of time or, or years to come running those Super Speeder races and, and being a part of those cup fields? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's definitely 
been fun with the next gen car, even though I mean it is expensive. It's nice that I know I can buy the same thing Hendrick has. Obviously, we don't set them up the same way. That's that's a little bit difficult, but you know we had the same equipment, and uh, fortunately, I've got you know I think I'm rolling up on I don't remember how many start. I got 350, 360 NASCAR starts, so I think Cup I'm you know somewhere around 100 to 150. But um, fortunately, I've got a lot of seat time. Let's put it that way. And uh, one time we figured it up and I had driven around the earth almost four times in a NASCAR vehicle. So <laughs> been here a little wow. while, but um, you know, it's, I think for me, I could see myself doing exactly what Brennan did and, and running the speedways who knows the next 10 years. Right. Like it just, I don't, I don't have any end in sight. Let's put it that way. I love that. Uh, BJ, last thing for me, I don't know if Nick's got anything else before we move on to our next segment here. Um, you know, with, with where you're at in, in this organization and, you know, th- these these races you've been running and everything here, um, when you're not racing, are you, are you still get are you still enjoying watching the product? Is it is it hard not to be at the racetrack and whether it's, you know, not being a full time owner or not being a full time driver? Do you, do you still enjoy the product what NASCAR is putting out even, even when you're you're not there at the track? Yeah. I mean, a very honest answer on that is I really enjoy it at home. I love keeping up with it and because I, I mean, I've developed so many friends over the years and so many relationships and like I said, drivers, crew members, owners, it, everybody, right. Like all the media, like I just, I had a blast with Bob at the kickball tournament, right. Just talking and hanging out and uh, Rutledge was there. Like, it's just, you know, I miss being around everyone. So watching the races is kind of my way to keep up and then still talk during the week. Uh, I have uh, RC car races at my house now on that indoor track and invite some of the NASCAR people over, you know, usually once every two weeks, something like that. But, um, you know, I'm definitely keeping up with all of it. I will say being at the track and not being a full-time owner, I have no interest in. I am. I definitely walk in the garage and I'm like, you know what? I don't want my own trailer here, right? Like I just, it just feels different. So I enjoy the races I go to, but traveling to them or being there, I just, I just don't have it. I just don't have any interest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, definitely. I get that. I, so I got two things here. We'll go with the first one. You're kind of piggybacking from a, a couple of steps back. So talking about Daytona and right, Atlanta and all these races that you would run. One of my favorite things to ask the guys that run a Daytona and they they just have the 500 plan or a limited schedule. If they were to win the Daytona 500, would plans change to run a full ski, a season now that you're going to be locked into the playoffs? I, I ask you that. If you were to win Daytona or Atlanta, would there be a scramble in the 78 camp to get you full time and be in the playoffs? Yeah, I never say never, but I'd say never to that. <laughs> it's not, not, not no interest. Um, I don't want to be, I don't want to ever be in the playoffs and not be competitive, right? Like it's just uh, that series, man. Like it's the best in the world. Um, when you get to get to those tracks that aren't super speedways, it's a whole nother level, right? It's, sure. Super speedways are very difficult in their own way. They're a craft. You have to be very good to, to win them, but they're um, they're their own craft and they're not the whole playoffs. Let's put it that way. There you go. And, and lastly, you're mentioning about things you would never do. What about a broadcast or an analyst role? Is that something that interests you or you'd like to see yourself in a booth or calling the races on MRN or any kind of media capacity someday? Yeah, I mean, um, Mike Joy uh, brought me up for just a short, I think, couple minutes. Uh, hung out with him and Clint uh, at Talladega and getting to see everything that, you know, those guys do during the broadcast was really impressive and I like a challenge and I would definitely enjoy doing that to some capacity, but I am, um, I've never been approached for it and I don't know if it's uh, in the future, but I definitely have a lot of respect for all of that and uh, would enjoy the challenge. That's great. PJ McLeod here with us this week on let's go racing. We will continue with BJ as we get into our uh, news and notes, our tap headlines in the sport. Dom, where are we going to start off this week? Well, we're going to start with a transition from, from one racing series to the next, and that looks like Haley Deegan will be making that next jump from NASCAR to the Indy Next Series in 2025. It was announced on Monday, October 14th, that Haley Deegan will be competing in the Indy NTX by Firestone Series for HMD Motorsports starting next year. She'll be driving the number 38 entry in the full-time 14 race schedule that that season have. It would be the equivalent, I would say, Tyler, of the NASCAR Xfinity Series. In IndyCar. So, Deegan making that jump from NASCAR to IndyCar starting next year. I was surprised by this news. Uh, she's never run open wheel before. We've seen her be successful when she was running the uh, 
the the, the KNN series the you know uh, years ago, and you know, obviously has a decent number of truck and some Xfinity starts. BJ, what what do you think about Haley Dinkin making this move over to open wheel, going to the IndyCar side of things? You know, I'm I'm just uh, happy she's driving something, right? Like I am a fan of Haley's. I've talked to her maybe ten minutes in my life, but um, I uh, actually grew up. You know, I, the the Meta Militia and Brian Deegan when I was probably. 15, maybe 16, something like that was like the coolest thing. So, um, I was, you know, my, my generation got to see the, you know, the freestyle motocross world come to life and all of that stuff with them and Pastrana and just, you know, that, that error. So I was watching Haley before she was racing anything to do with asphalt when she was in stadium trucks or whatever they call it. It, um, it was really cool to watch that stuff. So I, uh, you know, I'm a supporter of hers and, and I want her in NASCAR and I think, you know this her trying this out you know we'll see where it goes but i um i'm just happy to see her race and getting a full-time deal and hopefully uh you know with you saying it being his 14 race schedule maybe she'll still fit some nascar stuff in there somewhere you never know yeah i mean so dominic what's your thoughts on on uh hayley digging go to indycar here yeah, I was quite surprised to see that at first, too, to be honest with you. But nice to see her landing somewhere. And I think she has shown talent. She has shown that she can get it done behind the wheel of a race car. And we saw those in the Canaan West Series. She won twice, I believe. And she did have some flashes of brilliance there in the Truck Series and Xfinity. And we'll see what the IndyCar Series can hold for. It's something completely different. And, I, and she's acknowledged, too, that she's never run open wheel. But I, I got to give her credit and commend her for trying something different. Yeah, I think so. I, I think it'd be fun to watch and uh, glad to see your career continue. As BJ mentioned, just getting a ride, getting a full-time ride anywhere is a big deal. So, uh, yeah, that's for sure. Dominic, uh, what else we got here? So looking ahead to the NASCAR race weekend, we have the South Point 400, the opening round of eight race for the NASCAR Cup Series, as well as the NASCAR Xfinity Series this week. No trucks this weekend. But when you look ahead to the NASCAR race, Kyle Larson is your odds-on favorite heading into the weekend. Odds supplied here by the racingexperts.com and according to DraftKings as well. Kyle Larson had a plus 370 or 3.7 to 1. Christopher Bell, who finished runner up in this race, four and a half to one in the springtime with four and a half to one odds. Danny Hamlin, Ryan Blaney at six to one. Tyler Reddick at five to one. William Byron at six and a half to one. Chase Elliott, 10 to one. Joey Logano, who won the poll here in the springtime sitting at 12 to one. So certainly some, some of your odds on favorites there, but I'm also looking at the other side of the entry list there too, Tyler. And we have 38 drivers that are going to be competing, including Cody Ware in the number 15. We have Shane Van Gisbergen running the 16 car and old seven time, a former winner at Las Vegas motor speedway himself. Jimmy Johnson will be returning to the driver's seat in the 84 car. So we have the odds on favorites. We have the guys that don't run every week. Tyler, who sticks out the most to you in your head? I mean, it's got to be the guy that's the hottest right now, Kyle Larson. Um, and he's done great at this racetrack in the past uh, with wins there. I think he's got to be the favorite for sure. And he would be my pick this week. But BJ, uh, before we you know pick some winners and everything here, tell me your thoughts on uh, on Vegas and that track. The, uh, the racing we've seen there seems like th this race uh, has been pretty exciting. Seems like it's turned in kind of one of the more marquee races on the NASCAR calendar now. Yeah, it's it's actually one I love to I, run, I love to run that track. It's um it's gotten a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun in an X Gen car. It's a lot of fun in an Xfinity car. It's a lot of fun in a truck. So, a lot of speed. Um, corners feel sharper than they look on TV. Uh, track feels narrower than it looks on TV. It um it really is just a good time, and it's uh you know it's proven to be an attrition race too. Uh, you know I would say a fair amount, maybe three out of four. So. Um, it's, uh, it's one that the playoff guys definitely have to watch that, that side of it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Dominic, who are you looking at, uh, this week? Who, who, who's your pick? Who stands out to you? I feel like all the guys that run up front at Vegas don't run up front by accident. You see the, the best of the best on this mile and a half track run up front really well. I think a driver that we have not seen quite close the deal is going to close the deal this weekend. Christopher Bell in that number 20 car, I think, gets it done this weekend. Gets to the championship four for the third straight year. I, I, I said I like uh, Kyle Larson this week. Hard to pick against him. But for me, I think you have to look at those Hendrick cars. Kyle Larson, but also I think you have to keep in mind William Byron here, who's won it at Vegas before as well. And, and these are the type of tracks that are suited for him. I think that either one of those guys 
could win this race and make a statement to put themselves in good position for that uh, that final four round here. Uh, BJ, I mean, a lot on the line here at this point. I mean, you 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 win now, you're locking yourself into the championship four here. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I've been around uh, Kyle a little bit, Larson, and uh, I've been around Cliff some. And, and um, you know, I guess the biggest thing when you're in the playoffs and you have a driver that does nothing but try to pass cars and win races, it's a good a good thing to have. So um, that's uh, that's Kyle all day. He's not worried about playoffs. He's not worried about anything. When he fires that car up, he just literally drives as quick as he can till the checkered flag falls. So I uh, enjoy that about watching him race. And uh, I think that's, you know, really the best characteristic he has going into the playoffs because it just wins. Right. And his team, they're flawless. They, uh, they put in a lot of work, a lot of effort, just like, you know, the other cup teams, but um, they, uh, they too just stay focused on that, on that checkered flag. And I think that's why you see the level of wins that they have. Yeah. Yeah. They've been, they've been dominant. They've been very good so far this point in the season. Uh, last segment before we wrap up, it is our mailbag segment where we ask you to submit questions to us on uh, Facebook.com uh, slash Star Podcast, on X at Star Podcast, also by email, David Star Podcast at gmail.com. And our first question in the inbox this week comes from Dave, and it's for BJ. Dave wants to know BJ, who were some of your favorite racers growing up? Uh, the first one that comes to mind is Richard Petty. Um, I can remember, you know, pretending to play and, and you know, be him or, um, you know, just, you know, racing with some of my friends there around my carport or something like just, you know, having a good time. So my first one was Richard. Um, Jeff Gordon was the, the you know, big, the one I really looked up to as I started racing stock cars and, you know, trying to make it to the next level and, and um you know dale singer uh dale singer was was somebody i modeled a lot of stuff after and just uh unbelievable amount of respect for the the three guys i just named and what they accomplished and you know got to know jimmy johnson a little bit through the asa stuff because my first race was in 1997 and so was his um got to know him there and then uh, see him you know, go from there to a seven time champion and when i talked to him he's the exact same guy that he was that I knew in 1997, he has never changed his work ethic. He's never changed what he does. He, uh, he's just a, a really awesome uh, individual. So um, definitely always looked up to the way he handled the success that he had and, and what he's done with his life. Yeah. That's a great answer there. Uh, for me, Dominic, I, I was always a Jeff Gordon fan. And the, the, the thing I, I love about Jeff, not only the way he carried himself and what he did to, promote the sport to new heights we haven't seen before but you talk about the longevity we've seen how many recently dom these drivers when they get towards the end there's a significant fall off or they're not competitive they're not contending for championships i know that jeff gordon's last championship was 2001 and he hung it up there in the in the mid 2010s but right till the very end his final race, he was competing for a championship in the championship four. I mean, that's that's just unheard of now in in, in days with the way uh, things are so competitive. I mean, a lot of these guys are, are stepping away when they they don't have much left. I mean, Jeff Jeff Gordon, the way he was running, he he could have ran another three four more years at least, probably if he wanted to. Oh, certainly so. It, uh, drivers like him, Rusty Wallace, come to mind that longevity that they were just able to be competitive throughout their entire career. I'd even throw Mark Martin into there and the end of his career, still running very yeah. well, well into his fifties, competing for wins and winning polls and doing what he did. And, and and like you, I grew up a Jeff Gordon fan, and and I've made it no. There's no question who my all-time favorite driver is with being Jeff Bodine and having the chance to work with him. And we got his book published. So the two Jeffs, any any Jeff, I guess, in the sport, I've, I've been a fan of for sure, Tyler. But uh, working with Bodine over the years, to, to work with your childhood hero is certainly a dream come true. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Martin Martin is an, an awesome one to bring up. He um, That guy's work ethic is unrivaled also. And he uh, to win races and, and settle on the pole at age 50, I think it was 2009 or 2010, it was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. And that's because of his work ethic. I mean, the guy, I wouldn't put it past him right now to get in a, get in a cup car. And I, I mean, what is he? He's probably 60 somewhere in that area now. I bet he could get in a cup car right now and run within a 10th or two of the guys that are out there. 
it's he's literally that guy, right? Like he's he just has that that he just had never changed, right? He's just always working. BJ, I loved that season when you know he he had done the part time stuff and it was running very competitive, and everybody's like, hmm, maybe he should come back full time, you know? Like he's 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 still running up front, and then signs with Hendrick and wins five races, finishes second in points, only to Jimmy Johnson this year. Uh, that year, that that was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen of, of what he did that 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 year with Hendrick uh, when he came out. Up, yeah, I look up to that right now. Like that's I'm 40 right now, and I'm like, man, could I just work hard enough in the next 10 years to be as good as Mark was then? <laughs> right. So, which I'm not by no means, but he um, he's just somebody I look up to and and uh, work towards, and you know, he helps he what he did helps me not worry about being 40 right now. <laughs> well, even beyond that, you can add Harry Gant to that. I think he's NASCAR's oldest, oh, yeah. 52. Morgan Shepard at 53. So there's still, you can still oh. be very competitive into your 50s. Absolutely. Harry, I was a huge fan of his. I was kind of, um, back then would have been a bandwagon fan, right? Like I didn't know much about Harry and I was a kid when he was, when he was winning, I think it was 93 or 92 when he won all those races, something like that. Um, but as soon as I seen that green car hauling butt, I'm like, wow you know and then i jumped on and then i was a harry gant fan forever right like i still I, I talk about harry probably two or three times a year right now um at least once a year in interviews i talk about harry he's just he's somebody that was unbelievable in his time and and i mean he just he just did a great job and and had a lot of a lot of uh you know success there that was something to definitely look up to mm -hmm. Certainly. next question uh in the inbox this comes from patrick patrick wants to know BJ, off the racetrack, what are some of your favorite cars you've owned? Yeah, so that's that's a hard one to answer, man. Um, I still have my very first uh, – my parents had a Jeep that they let me drive when I was like three. I have that right now. <laughs> uh, the 45 Willys. Um, I, have, uh, my, I have a Toyota Tacoma that I used to drive around my parents, my parents' land uh, when I was 12, 13 years old. Uh, I have it. it has thirty eight thousand original miles on it. That's one of my wow. favorite. Dang! Uh, I've got a, a Z06 Corvette that I uh, bought new, and um, you know it was. It's a story uh, that I did um, Corey's podcast. Uh, I don't know a couple months ago, and um, talked a little bit about it. But that car almost got taken back because uh, we were having a little bit of a tough time with the business and kind of shifting where we were heading. And it was right before we started the racing stuff. And I kept that car to, to remind me of tough times and how things can be good and turn bad and, and turn good again if you don't quit. So um, I got that. I've got an 06 Duramax that I had to drive to Iowa for K and N races twice. I drove it to um kansas i drove it to texas for xfinity because i couldn't afford to fly when we started the team right so i have that truck sitting here um as far as my dream car i do have a lamborghini aventador sv and uh that's one of my favorites um i think my favorite filling car to just drive i have a 60 uh, 65 lincoln continental convertible um it's the car with the suicide doors on it um, that my wife bought me a couple years ago. And I think just overall feeling when you sit down in a car, that's my favorite. Like it's, you get in that car and drive and you feel like you're in the 1950s or sixties and things are just cool. Right. So, um, yeah, I definitely could keep going, man. I'm a car guy. That's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's, that's better than anything I've ever owned. Like I've owned Dominic, uh, Three different vehicles in my life. One was uh, my first vehicle my parents gave me uh, when I was in high school, an 01 Ford Expedition. Uh, that thing got 13 miles a gallon. Uh, <laughs> that I had to fill it up every week just driving to and from school. Uh, and then I got a Kia Forte after that. I enjoyed that, got good mileage, but then uh, Driving through Nebraska, some idiot totaled my car running a red light through the snow, so that didn't last. And now uh, I've been driving my uh, 2021 Chevy Trailblazer, which uh, has done me pretty good since. So uh, I've enjoyed my vehicles, though. What driven down? So mostly just sedans and small cars. I, my first car that my parents gave me was a 2002 Honda Civic. Same thing in high school. Did so great on it, but the, the transmission slipped on it when I was a senior in high school, so... That didn't last long. I remember they sold it and, and then drove around a 
Chrysler Concorde. My grandparents had given that to me. And then a 2009 Honda Civic, which was like my jam, I guess, for 10, 12 years. And my wife and I, we recently purchased a Toyota Camry. So you go from having a car that's 250,000 miles, that Civic's still running, to, to a car with four miles on it. It was definitely an adjustment. Never had a brand new car like that. So that was pretty cool to, to see that. And that's been the new whip going to the racetrack now, Tyler. That's awesome. I like it. I like it. Uh, next one in the inbox. Uh, this one comes from Jeremy. Jeremy wants to know, BJ, you have a unique brand and style compared to most drivers. Where does this come from? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's, I guess it uh, it's kind of a byproduct of making it my way, right? I've had a lot of great people around me and, and it would be nothing without the awesome people I've been surrounded by and the great parents I had. But and I think, um, you know, being able to own my own team through my NASCAR career, I never got told what I had to wear, right? And uh, I just kind of stuck with my style and did my thing the whole time. And then it turned into fun. People enjoy it. They actually, uh, Shane, <laughs> he'll come, uh, he'll come, um, Shane or Chevrolet, he'll come by and say, man, you don't have flip-flops on today. I'm not talking to you because you guys so used to me wearing flip-flops at the racetrack, right? So it's either flip-flops or cowboy boots. Um, it's uh, It's been a lot of fun just having my own style and doing my own thing. And, and NASCAR, you know, there was a period there, um, you know, I had a couple rides when I was like 17 or 18 and, and they were like, oh, you got to wear the polo shirt and tuck it in and wear the dress pants and all that stuff. And I did it. I was told to do it at a ride. But the second I was spending my own money figuring out how to make it and then spending it racing, I wasn't going to listen to anybody telling me how to dress. So right now, if I could drive a winning car, I'll wear what they tell me to wear. Right. But uh, if I'm driving my own car, you'll see me show up with skulls and who knows, some kind of affliction shirt or uh, jeans, flip flops or spike boots. That's pretty much the, the get up. Well, your Xfinity team logo, that, that's got like a skull in it or something, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's got a skull and I actually got a tattoo on my shoulder when I was uh, 19 and I had a lady in Wachula draw it for me. And um, that that tattoo on my shoulder is what I'm uh, Jessica and I made the um, BJ McLeod Motorsports logo out of. So that uh, that's actually my tattoo. And um, it was something that it's always been special to me because we put so much work into this team, just like, you know, every NASCAR team owner. Um, we you know, there's so many times that you're trying to just make it work and it uh it's you look up there and see that logo and remember working in Wachula trying to trying to get to this level and it just uh fuels you a little bit so that's uh that's one reason I've always been proud to have that be a part of the logo oh that's awesome I love that uh I've always loved your style BJ I'm glad to know more of the backstory the tattoo that that's badass uh last question then we'll uh we'll end on this uh BJ uh Dan no uh, I know he's not here but uh Danny's curious What's your favorite David Starr story from when he raced for you? You know, I think from when he raced for me, he, for me, he just always ran well. But there was uh, there was there was some kind of fight he got into back in the day on pit road, and I'm like, man, you didn't want to scrap with David, right? Like he could get it done. So I enjoyed watching that video. That's probably my funniest David Starr moment. But um, it uh, it was definitely um, driving for me. He just he just drives hard, man, and he's in great shape. Yeah. He's always made sure that that the physical side of the sport didn't uh, didn't get to him. So it um it was definitely you know nice having him in the car with the work ethic that he had and and that he just don't quit. Oh yeah, that's fantastic, uh, guys. Before we go, uh, just kind of around the room, uh, check it in with everybody here. Uh, Dominic, what's uh, what's going on with you this week, man? So our team will be out full force, Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Jonathan Field, our managing editor at the Racing Experts, and myself will be out there to help with our team's coverage. And yeah, it'll be my first race since Atlanta. So looking forward to getting back out to the Speedway this weekend. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, BJ, what's, what's going on with you the next couple of days, man? Uh, I got a big night tomorrow night with the RC car races at my house. Going to have, uh, you know, a couple, probably a couple of drivers will be here. It depends on Vegas, whether they got time to come, but uh, a lot of my friends will come over and we'll, uh, we'll race some RC cars and definitely we'll drive some side-by-sides this week. I made uh, 200 laps with the go-kart this morning. So um, just a uh, little bit of activity here at the, here at the property. Very nice. Love that. Uh, I'll be uh, enjoying some, uh, some football this weekend and some racing and uh, it should be good. Just kind of a weekend at home, just kind of relax a little bit and go from there. But 
BJ, uh, it was our pleasure having you here, man. A lot of fun. Great conversation. This flew by. Uh, Where can people connect with you and and, and see what's going on with you and uh, Team Live Fast there, uh, BJ? Absolutely. Thank you guys again for uh, for having me on. And uh, anytime, man, happy to be here. Yeah, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, We will put the checkered flag out in this edition of Let's Go Racing. As always, subscribe to the show. New episodes out each and every week. Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube. Leave us a five-star review or don't leave us one at all. Hit the like button. We'd appreciate it. Follow us on social media at Star Podcasts on X, Facebook. You can email us, davidstarpodcasts at gmail.com. And uh, we'll see you right back here next week. For BJ McLeod, Dominic Aragon, David Starr, Tyler Jones, saying so long. It's been another edition of Let's Go Racing. See you next week.